be shouted. Well done, Manchester United. It's a sharing up. And so far, it's funny. And it's off, saved it. United again. Ready? Welcome to United Hour, your official Red Cafe podcast for all things Manchester United. I'm your host, Nick. I am Mark. I'm Colm. Yeah, big welcome back to Colm. I was actually trying to work out when you've last been on. I think it might be about a year since you've been with us, right? I think you've been busy with uh, marriage and jobs and things like that, right? Yeah, busy uh, trying to avoid having to talk anymore about that dreadful last season than was absolutely necessary, mainly. But yeah, you're you're excited for the new season, so you were begging to come back on, weren't you? <laughs> begging, Nick, absolutely begging. <laughs> we'll put a bigger applause for you in post <laughs> yeah, as well. That's fine. But yeah, look, pre-season is over. All the matches are done. We're getting ready for the real thing now. Uh, about a week away, we're recording on Sunday night. So yeah, just a day after our last match against Milan. Um, I've kind of watched about, I'd say, fifty percent of the pre-season stuff. What about you two guys? Every minute for me. Yeah, yeah, I've been pretty much, pretty much every minute, just waiting to see more of James Garner and being bitterly disappointed <laughs> each, each time. But I love preseason yeah. though; it's like a weird, hopeful, almost childlike um, world where everything's going to be okay every single year, and then we get into the grim reality of the Premier League season. But for yeah, those sort of two months, till. we get to see the kids. <laughs> Same kids that play every single year, and then you know. Well, you, see- you say that though, but I would like to like cash your mind, mind back a year to preseason well, last yeah, year, yeah, which was an absolute mess. That was its own thing. Just entire, like you yeah. know, yeah, like normally I agree with you. Like you get excited, new players. Let's see how we're going to go. But yeah, last season it just kind of everything just started badly. Whereas you know this kind of preseason has been a kind of breath of fresh air, seeing like we've won every match. All right, the last two we've only just kind of won them. Uh, you know, last minute winner by Mata out in Norway and uh, penalties against Milan. But yeah, look, we have won every single match. Seen a lot of new young players doing well. The kind of new style of football is looking good. So yeah, just really comparing to how last season, like we were almost not looking forward to uh, the start of the year. And this year, there's just like a, such a vast difference. Uh, and yeah, it's the kind of difference, I guess, between uh, Jose and Ole. Um, but yeah, look, I'm actually now looking pretty forward to it. I know some people are still stuck about transfers and whatever, and we'll get a little bit into that. But yeah, I'm pretty happy with where we're at and looking quite excited for the start of the new season again. I mean, um, if we have a little look at kind of the Milan teams, normally, yeah, what I want to talk about is like, who do you think is going to start our game against Chelsea next Saturday? And um, I was a little bit surprised by the kind of lineup against Milan because I thought it'd be pretty close to who's going to start next week. But now then looking at it, I don't actually think it is going to be. Uh, I mean, I think some players are pretty locked in. Look, it's going to be De Gea, wan uh Shaw. For me, it's definitely going to be Lindelof. I know maybe, Mark, we had a quick chat. Maybe you don't agree. But I think the other centre-back spot is up for grabs. Um, then it's going to be McTominay. Pogba, assuming all is well with him. Rashford, Martial, James, and then apart from that, then there is a couple of kind of spots up for grabs still there. I mean, uh, where where were you at with it, Mark? I think you had written down your first 11, what you think, right? Yeah, so I've gone, unintentionally, I've gone Brexit FC a little bit, um, eight out of the 10 being British. Uh, so I've got De Gea, um, Wan-Bissaka. Uh, I've got someone as yet to be announced uh, as part of the starting centre back too, but um, Slabhead, I got him in there. Just like to say um, points for me for being the first one to say Slabhead on the podcast as well. Uh, to Anzebe, I've got instead of Lindelof, Shaw, McTominay, I have Lingard and Pogba with Greenwood, Rashford, and Martial starting. Yeah, look, there's absolutely no chance that no is going to be our starting lineup. No against that's, that's just Mark starting lineup. That's just Mark playing, pick the team, you know? Defeatist. Yeah, exactly. That's what your, like, kind of hope you wish with yeah. all your young players, whatever. And yeah, all right, get that. But that is not going to be our starting On lineup. On form, other than Gomez, that's the team. For, for, for those who have earned it over pre-season, I think that that's, that's the best team that you could pick on form. 
Yeah, no, look, I'm excited about these news players, but Tu and Zemi is not starting next week. Greenwood, I'll be very surprised, although maybe he has a bit of a shout because, yeah, he's been exciting. But, yeah, look, it's going to be Lindelof and one other, and I think it's going to be too early for Maguire. If I had to put my money on it, I don't know, actually, like Rojo started yesterday. Jones started the last time. I, personally, I would say Jones. I, I'm not really. What do you think, Colm? Who would you go for to partner Lindelof? I think he'll start. I think he'll start Maguire. I don't think it will be too soon. He referenced there in his post match press, presser um, after I see that um, you know he'd had a preseason, just not with us, obviously, um, and that obviously we assess that when he comes in terms of his fitness level and his, his suitability. But I think he. I think he'll start Maguire. I think I know it's Chelsea, and there's maybe an inclination there to drop back to. Smalling or Rojo, but none of those seem in favour whatsoever. You know? It won't be Smalling because I was actually looking at like how many minutes everybody's played in yeah. pre season, and Smalling is way out of favour. Yeah. He has not played any minutes in the last two matches. Uh, he's had the least minutes of any of our centre backs, even less than Rojo, or who I, who I expected to be, you know, one of the first out the door. Yeah. Whereas he actually started yesterday. So Smalling is way down the list now. An element of that, and I, I do think he is. Down the list, I think it's the same thing that happened with Gareth Southgate, where he was excluded from the England team. That he's just so um, not suited to a certain style of football that Ole clearly wants to play. Yeah, not good on the ball, basically. But also, I think Smalling's a completely known quantity at United. You know, say what you like about him, but he is consistent. He's a consistently good defender. He's consistently athletic, consistently quite good in the air, and consistently diabolical with the ball at his feet. So he's very much a known quantity. He's been here for ten years. Um, so you know what you're going to get. So I do think a part of his minutes in preseason were also centred around the fact that Rojo's coming back after an injury plague season, completely out of favour, but maybe deserves to be given a chance by. It was exactly the same until he got injured. He seemed to be the one that was mainly getting the minutes, um, and then Jones likewise. So I think those players almost needed more preseason minutes than what you would expect from Smalling. And Smalling also has this tendency to start out of the manager's plans, and by quickly into the season everyone else is injured or horrendous and he he quickly re-establishes himself and I wouldn't be surprised although I would be disappointed if that happened again this year I still think it'd be Maguire and Lindelof all the yeah long. we'll see I mean yeah I know you had this uh, argument last week didn't you Mark with the other uh, Ushwin and Ed about there was no argument <laughs> yeah well I actually totally agreed with you I was surprised <laughs> like for me like I know Jones is a massive sick note and a massive liability because you know he can't manage more than three matches in a row but for me he's just like a vastly superior player to Smalling and it's just a big shame that he's never managed to get over all those injuries I agree I agree with that it's just that it's not you know he never it doesn't matter. It almost doesn't matter how good a player he is because he's never he's never fit, you know. But yeah, look, like look, we all I guess. I I personally think it'll be too early for Maguire, and I expect to see I'd say Jones outside chance for Rojo starting. But yeah, we'll see. It'll be interesting there. Then all right, look, look, let's look at the midfield. I mean, there's have been a few kind of rumours talking about the fact that Pogba didn't play and didn't go out to uh, Cardiff for that game. He played yesterday. He, yeah, he played today. Hasn't there been some kind of closed door? Closed door friend. Match? It was either today or yesterday. I can't quite remember where where my head's at. But um, yeah, he he played a lot of minutes in that, from what I can gather. So I think it was just a case of just not risking him travelling. Yeah, for the those who haven't heard about it, I think there was some behind the doors game against Blackburn youth team or something. Under twenty three. Minutes yeah. were given to Sanchez. Uh, Pogba, I heard even Damian had a few games there. If anybody forgets, he's actually still one of our players. Um, I think we won 4 0, a couple of goals from Chong, one from Lingard, and. Two from Lingard, uh, one from Greenwood, one from, uh, okay, one from yeah, Chong, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there has been another little game squeezed in there. Um, but, yeah, look, midfield, where, where do we think we're at? For me, McTominay is definitely starting the season. The last two matches, Matic and McTominay have both started and Matic has not looked great. I mean, you know, he's at fault for at least one of the goals against Milan yesterday. Um, but he has kind of gone with this double defensive setup. But I don't know whether he'd prefer to go McTominay, Pogba. I mean, yeah, what, where, where do you think we're at, Colm? I think it'll be um, I think it'll be a 4-2-3-1, definitely. I think that's what he's leaned towards. I think if more personnel come in, between now and the end of the year, I think we could move to a four three three, and we will definitely use it. But I think he's he's relatively well set that he wants to play with this four two three one. I think it will be McTominay and Manich, and I think that will be a big issue for a lot of um, us fans. I I I I think Manich is nailed on to start against Chelsea, and I think it's a, a bad idea. But 
I think there's. But just what are you saying? Pogba won't play, or you think he'll play further forward? Uh, probably further forward. I think. Yeah. Well, no, you mentioned that Pogba is also a guaranteed. So I think I think one of them's pushed forward, or he's going to play a four-three-three. But I just don't see him drop a Matic given the minutes he's given him. And I think he just likes this kind of old head, you know, wise man positionally aware. But I I struggle with seeing the, the preseason that Matic has had and, and not not thinking that Ole will be aware of the glaring, glaring deficiencies that are creeping into his game as he gets um, a year older each year. And I just, I, I really worry for us in that sense. I've actually not, I should actually look back at what a line has been. I don't know if in pre-season, has he started McTominay, Matic and Pogba in any of the matches? Not, not to mind. Nothing, nothing comes to mind. I don't think he has. Yeah, I don't think he has. So I think it's either going to be McTominay, Pogba or McTominay, Matic. Um, Pogba's had some kind of back problem apparently but he did play some minutes in this kind of like friendly game there is still rumours about obviously people are making a big deal about that he didn't play in that Milan game and that he still wants out of the club um, not really you know clear on that Ole's been clear and said that he's staying he's going to not go in anywhere and going to be playing I mean uh, you know I had saved a few questions that we'd had from some of the listeners and there had been a question actually uh, back about saying, what do you think the reception will be for uh, Pogba when the season starts, if he's still playing here? And I, we've had this kind of situation before, whether it was Rooney, I think he was the big one that kind of, you know, would ask for a transfer and still came back. Yeah, and, yeah there was a, some fans are a bit annoyed, but, you know, after he scores a couple of goals, it's kind of mostly forgotten. And I'd expect similar, basically, that, yeah, he'd get a lukewarm reception to start with. But as long as he performs, people forget pretty quickly, really. So I think Solskjaer did a good job of diffusing a lot of that. Um, Because since he came out and I think he had it, it, not with rants, but um, when he was saying that there's a possible agenda being set against Pogba and that he... He sort of gave reassurances about his conduct and what have you. Since since then, a lot of that Pogba stuff has just really, really died down. It was at a fever pitch, and then Oli gave that press conference, and it's just all died away completely. If um if anything has come back up in the last couple of days, it's been literally because we didn't risk him in terms of travelling. But then I think news got out there he'd played the game today, so it was just people were just sort of scratching their heads and trying to connect dots where there were none to be connected. Um, I think there'll be there'll be a small section of the fans base which which does give them some pelters, but again, I think it it'll be mostly I think people getting behind him. Yeah, yeah, and for me, you know, I want him to stay, and I think you know he should be a big part of us going forward. Like, I'm still annoyed, obviously, that he made those comments about you know maybe it's time for a new challenge, blah blah blah. But yeah, look, if he stays, you know, it could be fishing for a new contract. Who knows? Um, I don't have too much worry about him kind of, um, you know, not being happy about staying and that kind of thing. I'm pretty sure he's the kind of player that if he does stay, he'll still perform for us. And I think, yeah, he could be a big part of this kind of new setup as we go forward under Ole. I mean, we saw him on top form when Ole first turned up. And, uh, you know, Pogba was playing absolutely out of his skin for those couple of months before it all the form dropped off. And, yeah, hopefully we can get back to that again. Um, so, yeah, for me, he's surely going to be starting there. Then you're right. If we, I'm assuming that Rashford, James, who, yeah, I've been more impressed by than I expected in pre-season. I thought he might have just been somebody who kind of comes in the squad and maybe slowly works his way into the team. But, uh, yeah, I expect him to be starting against Chelsea now. Martial as well and then yeah there still seems that there's that kind of number 10 spot up for grabs I mean Com, if you're saying you think Matic McTominay are starting then what are you saying Pogba is going to be in playing in that advanced role I'd like to see him there but I think I think um I don't know that Solskjaer views him in that way um personally I think he'd be our most effective 10 um I think Matt is minutes as much as I adore him and I'm happy to see his contract extended due to his experience and his quality in, in certain matches. I, I really don't want to see too much of him at 10. Lingard, always very happy to see Lingard at 10. I do think that's the best position rather than coming off the right. Um, but I think pound for pound, if we if we had two good eights, then Pogba, I think, should be let, let completely free in an attacking sense. I think we should take defensive responsibility away from him. My only concern with that is then is who takes the ball off the centre backs and actually uses it well. But to be honest, McTominay has been so impressive to me throughout preseason and throughout the end of last year. He was constantly 
um, in big games and in just you know everyday Premier League games. He was um, looking impressive when we were really, really, really struggling. I think he gives you a base level that is always very, very good, and he's clearly growing in confidence. And people are starting to see that ability come out now. That I think. Uh, a lot of players at the club, and certainly Sir Alex would have always known that was there, and I think he could have a very, very big season for us. But yeah, I, I would love to see Pogba freed up and, and play further forward. But it still, it still depends on, I suppose, what happens um, before Thursday. Yeah, I mean, if we look at pre-season, then it looks like it's between Andreas and Lingard for playing in that number ten role. Basically, um, I would assume Ole goes with Lingard. Would you agree with that, Mark? I think he will, and I think he should. I think the, the I think the only thing where we differ other than the centre backs is whether it's going to be Greenwood or whether it's going to be James. If we were playing away from home, I would probably agree with you to go with Dan James. But I think because we're starting out at home, um, I would personally go Greenwood. But in terms of the number ten, um, yeah, I think I think it should be I think it should be Lingard. He's definitely got a. Would you be happy with Lingard playing ten for us all year? I don't see. I don't ever see him as an out and out ten though. Like I always, whenever I see Lingard being put in that position, I always see him as a as a ten stroke eight kind of player. Like yeah. he he will he he assumes that role that I think a lot of people think Bruno Fernandez will do in the sense that he's a ten, but he's more defensively responsible than your your average ten, I guess, than say a Mata, for instance. So he's willing to put a shift in in the middle of the park and come and help out defensively. Yeah. So I think that's it. If we go with James, then I would be mad to see Pereira there because I think James will handle his defensive responsibilities, or we can we can ask that of him. I think if we play Greenwood, then I think it's just I think it's better to have Lingard there. Yeah, that is what I'm expecting basically. I mean, it is a big year for Andreas. He's going to, you know, we said last year as well. It's the Mourinho gave him a chance, did that kind of weird thing where he gave him some games at like number six, but. Then, yeah, he was a bit lost. But, yeah, Ole seems to be very more set on playing him in more, like, advanced positions, which for me makes sense. Ole started him as a, as a six come eight, um, and then he made a few sort of high-profile errors, and Ole went on record saying, apparently, this is what he said to Andreas, was that he just, he, was, he wasn't he was calm enough for that position. You know, he, he was trying to do a million and one things and, and didn't have the kind of calm head you need to play in that position. And from then, he's kind of played him further forward. Um I worry for Andreas. I, I think I, I don't think he has a position. Um, I'd I'd like to see him at ten, and I wonder does he have the quality for that? I think he's great in the press and gives a lot of sort of tenacity and fight. And you know he had that one assist for Marshall, I think, um, which sort of showed you what he could do. But I just don't think he necessarily might provide enough um, that we would want. And um, so I do worry for him. I think I think that ten position is still a big problem, and that's why I was asking Mark about whether Lingard would be you know satisfactory there over the course of the year. I think we have, and I think this has been sort of exhibited through preseason that Ole I don't think knows who he wants to play there because it, it seems to chop and change. Even there against SC, we started with what looked like Andreas in the middle and Matt on the right, but it was quickly interchanging, and neither of them really seemed to be doing either job. So I think you'll probably see like a number ten by committee this year, yeah. um, like because Gomez will get. A few games there. Matt will get, as you said, like the odd correct game for him in that sort of position. Lingard can be counted on to be more defensively responsible, and he can also he has a habit of popping up with a big with a goal in a big game every now and then. So I think he could be counted on in away games and bigger home games. And um, and Andreas is just as, as a rotation option. He can also play as a more de facto central midfielder as well if Pogba's out for any reason. So or he can even do a stint on the right as well. So. There'll be games and there'll be a lot, a lot of time and a lot of minutes for all of them. Um, it, if it was up to me, I would probably just say effort and go with Gomez. But well, yeah. that's again, that's just me. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually very excited about Gomez. Like you know, there's been a lot of focus on Greenwood because he's had a few goals and everything this pre-season. But I'm as excited about Gomez actually from what I've seen. Uh, I think he is ready to play. And every time I've seen him play, I've been impressed. Uh, you know, his close control is as outstanding. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I do hope that he gets some chances and that he gets involved there. I mean, uh, Chong is thrown in there as well. I've been a bit less impressed by Chong, to be honest. And I think that maybe Chong could do with going out on loan. But, yeah, I know you're not a fan of any kind of loans, right, Mark? You prefer players stay at the club and develop. But... I think there'll just be enough games from this year. We've got the EFL trophy, the the old Checker Trade trophy or whatever the hell it's called, the the old the Johnson's windscreens paint <laughs> yeah. whatever it is. Um 
yeah, so I, as well as that, and obviously the League Cup and the Europa League as well, I just think that it, at least until January, that there's going to be enough games for him. And he will get, I think, maybe around about between eight and 12 starts, just though into that alone. Um, see, we could reassess it in January, obviously, because um, obviously a few more people are going to be fully fit, like Sanchez and whatnot. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, there is those couple of players who've kind of been a bit forgotten about in preseason. One is Sanchez, who's just not been involved at all. He is still one of our players and probably still our highest paid player mm. until Pogba gets a new contract. Um, he did actually have a really good, uh, whatever, Copper South American, Copper uh, America, then yeah. got injured, unfortunately. So he's not been involved at all. There is Fred as well that kind of had a bit of a disjointed preseason because I think he got married and missed like the first part of it. Yeah. Um, which is like your ridiculous timing by him. But anyway, uh, I guess, yeah, if you're going to get married, I guess it has to be in the summer. Um, but yeah, he should obviously be coming in as some kind of midfield option and f- get fighting for one of those places. But I think he'll be slowly worked back in because he's not been fully involved pre-season. But yeah, people might forget these guys exist. Sanchez, Fred, uh, we do still own Darmian. Um, I guess these we're expecting this, a few players to leave, uh, even though our transfer window finishes next Thursday, the 8th. Um, there's still this weird situation this year where the rest of Europe are still going for another couple of weeks, at least after that. And uh, this was, you know, I think it was a good decision that the window shuts before the season starts. But it does leave clubs in a bit of a difficult situation when other leagues are still able to come and like make offers and try and buy your players. I think the big issue around that is why does our league start on the 9th of August? We always start earlier because we have more matches, so they always have to start a little bit earlier than anybody else. But Klopp, Klopp raised the point the other day that like at least start on like the 24th something, and um, you know they have obviously we have those extra cups and stuff like that. But it, to me, it's just. That's that's the issue. Is how early we start. We play football for three weeks before anyone else in the world is playing football. You know, I just think it's mad. Yeah, we do have more teams in the league though, so there is a couple more weeks at least. We always need. Uh, even then, we still like you say the extra cups and whatever. We have too many matches. I think at some point, I don't know if it's this year or next year, that they're going to start bringing in some kind of Christmas break for everybody. Yeah. In fact, I think it's actually going to happen this Christmas. Uh, each team gets like a week off. Um, I need to go and check that, actually, whether it starts this year or next year. But, yeah, we are going to start bringing in some kind of Christmas break for teams, so they have some time off in that period. Um, but, no, yeah, look, we our league is bigger. You know, like Nobody else has that many teams in their top division. So, yeah, we always have to have those couple of extra weeks, I suppose. Will anyone really miss Norwich? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, Norwich. Sorry, Norwich listeners. And uh, But, yeah, look... look just to give a few mentions to some of the other players, I mean, Rashford is now obviously our first choice striker. I'm expecting 20 goals plus from him this season. And uh, I think, Colm, you missed that there was a ridiculous debate about halfway through last yeah, year yeah, where Ed it. and uh, Alex at the time were saying, oh, you know, Rashford maybe needs to go out on loan because it's not working for him over here and Mourinho's <laughs> yeah. not playing it. And like, for, for me, it was the most ridiculous idea ever. Um, not least yeah. because people forget what age Marcus Rashford is. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. and what like and what his comparative achievements in those in those years have been. Like it's it's literal madness. But yeah, look, now he's here. He's always put his full faith in him, and yeah, I think he's. Re- I'm expecting yeah, big things. He's gone straight into my fantasy team. That's for sure. Mine too. I think, yeah. Mine too. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, like, it's not chock full of United players. I can tell you that. No, I think I'm, I've got Juan Bissaka in my team as well. He's had a great preseason. I think he was like man of the match in a, like about half of our games. Three in pre-season. games, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, like he's looking like a great signing straight away. And like been freakish. I mean, he's dominant, dominant defensively, and just uh, seems positionally aware. His, his recovery and his physicality is unbelievable. But I also think people have been surprised by how good he is on the ball and, and how good his feet are. You know, there's a few times he's. He, he hugs the, the, the touchline and but uses the space really well. He very rarely gets caught out, very able to sort of check back in and beat a man and, and always has that option. I think we'll just see more and more for him. I would love him to have a competent right winger in front of him and that's why I, I quite would like to see Dan James get a run of um, games there because I think we would benefit immensely. You know, the, the AC game with, with Matt on the right was just, it was hard to watch game because that is just like four years of problems not being addressed and I'm not saying we need no, no right winger. I'm not saying we should have been in for Pepe or whatever else, but 
I think you have to at least have the, the threat on someone who looks like they might want to, you know, play on that part of the pitch for anything more than five minutes. Yeah, I still find it weird that Mata is being played on the right. Like I thought, now new contract, Ole's going to bring him and he's going to play him number ten because that's what he is. He's a number ten, and you know he was shunted out wide just to like fit in where we didn't have anybody else. But now, yeah, we've got an option over there, whether it's Greenwood, whether it's James. And yeah, for me, why isn't Mata being given a chance to lock down that number 10 position? Uh, you know, his creativity would like the faster players like Martial, Rashford, James all running off. I think it could like, work really well. I think in games I think in games where we're going to dominate possession and we're not going to come up against a really combative, uh, difficult midfield battle, I think Mata's 10 is perfect. You know, uh, and I just think that's patently obvious. And But that said, lots of top-level managers appear to disagree. So they must know something we don't. No, yeah, we'll see where that goes for him. And then, yeah, there was as well the slight experiment with Martial. He played up front in a couple of matches. Um, I'm still even not sure myself on whether his best position is wide or up front. Uh, he's, again, one of these players who needs to like lock down on what exactly he is. Uh, and he played pretty well when he played up front. I think, it was, was it Spurs where he started up front? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, what, what do you feel? Do you think his better position is as striker or out wide? It's difficult to tell. He's the same as Rashford in that sense. Is like they, they they both exhibit really good qualities in both areas of the pitch, but they also have no. But I don't. I think Rashford is a striker, and that when he's played wide, that he's out of position and he's not the right place for him. For me, Rashford is a striker, and he should be playing up front and banging in the goals for sure. Whereas with Martial, I'm not as sure. I I think Martial's a striker. I think, but I also think that it's. If you're looking to play kind of a, a positionless, formless kind of football in terms of your front three, and you throw in a guy like Mason Greenwood in there as well, then it, it only benefits them to to be able to go wherever it is that they need to be. If Martial needs to move in field, then he needs to be allowed to do that. If Rashford needs to come out wide and run the left channel like he was doing against Milan a lot, then he needs to be allowed to do that as well. It's just the case of being smart and saying, right, okay, he's occupying that space, so I need to go and occupy the space where he isn't anymore. It's just... I, th- I think they both need to just be smarter rather than just worrying too much about where their starting position is. They just both need to look out for one another a bit more and just start to work together as a tandem rather than just trying to be two good individuals. I think that's definitely part of it, and that's definitely what Ole wants. And you hear that in interviews with Marcus um, that I've heard him repeat you know, numerous times because he obviously gets asked the question a lot: "Are you, you know, do you see yourself as a nine? Um, do you see yourself as a left winger?" And he is always quick to say, "I don't. I see myself as a forward." You know, they can play right across the front three, and that's important, and, and everyone thinks that is important to the club, which I do get, and I agree with. But I think there does become a point where it's, like, detrimental to their sort of final development. I think, you know, a striker like Kane does not become that good a number nine by playing 11. There's just there's just no part of it. I know people, like, look to Henri and stuff like that about where you start your career and then the movements you can make afterwards, but I think... A lot of elements of good number nine play you do not see from either Rashford or Marshall. So hold up play for both of them is still, I think, a big struggle, particularly when the ball's in the air. I think Rashford is getting a lot better at his hold up play. It's definitely picked He's up. He's bulked yeah. up a lot. And even at the end of last season, I noticed yeah. that, and you know, it was something we talked about. Lukaku was never that great at it himself, even though he was big, strong player. No, because his touch is horrendous. And I actually think that Rashford can offer as much as Lukaku ever offered us, even in the hold up play. Well, I think Lukaku's hold-up play was terrible, so if, 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 if he only ever equals it, it won't be good enough, because Lukaku is, uh, like, for all the look of him, he's one of the worst at holding the ball up at all, because his touch is an absolute bomb square, but he wants to pass. But the other thing that neither of them do at all well is make moves inside the box, or really make attacking clever runs at all, something that Mason Greenwood does exceptionally well, and I think does show that he is a, a trademark number nine, is the movements across six-yard box when balls get pumped across. Like, Dan James, this... Tour has already put in 10 to 20 fizzers across the six-yard line that are really in that corridor of uncertainty that are just asking to be touched in. And on every occasion, almost, Martial and Rashford were both somewhere along the penalty spot looking disinterested. Similarly, for balls put in high, they just don't, to me, have that number nine instinct. And by constantly playing them off the wing or constantly chipping and, ch- and changing and one plays nine for a handful of games and then they switch and whatever else, you're never going to give them that time to really... I think develop that and work on that and I think there will come a point where this fluid system of interchangeableness and everyone playing everywhere 
it is this really cool kind of new idea that we all really like and it, and it sounds class and I do think there will come a point where neither of them fulfill on their undoubted potentials because they never got the necessary games in the one place to really really learn that trade and I do think that's a bit of concern I just think they both need, if, as, as long as they both learn how to release the ball they, I, I don't think they have like that big of a problem at all I, I don't think they're in any danger of not realising their potential I, I, I'm, I'm not with you on that I just think they just they just need to release the ball about half a second quicker than what they actually do. As long as they just get it in their head that they just need to play a bit quicker and just play a lot less within themselves and they can yeah. actually use their teammates a bit more, then then they'll be fine. No, if we cast our minds as well back to when Ole first came and we were on top form, it was Martial, Lingard, Rashford, all interchanging, all like, you know, moving and like in like the same sinking together on the same wavelength. And it was like great to watch. And yeah, Pogba behind them, bringing in the right balls from midfield. And it, yeah, and hopefully we're going to get the same again. Which would be absolutely class. My only thing when I say is about them not reaching their potential. I already think both of them are, are top level footballers and you can see the quality that is there. And yes, we just want consistency and maybe a bit, bit better decision making. And a lot of that comes from the style of football that's being played and the players around them and the system that Ollie puts in place. You can't just squirrely lay it at Martial's feet because he never got any service or whatever else. But when I talk of potential, I mean, I think both of them have the potential to be consistently 25 plus goal players in the Premier League, 20, like 30, you know, your Keynes, your Grouse, that, that real top level, top level attacker. You look at Mane and um, Salah both producing those kind of big numbers at, at Liverpool. I think both Marshall and Rashford can get to that and deliver that consistent, consistently. So it's a very high bar that I'm kind of setting when I talk about their potential and whether it will be reached or not. And I do think that a lot of that will come down to how they can figure out those little things. We all saw like, the Ronaldo comparison is played out um, beyond belief, but they are in those years, although exiting them, where you can forgive you know, the sort of sometimes petulant decision-making, the the poor choices, the sort of sporadic quality, some weeks great, some weeks not so great. But there has to come a time where that sort of switch flips and the, the, the decision-making becomes much more consistent, the quality becomes much more consistent. I can see bits of it. I just don't want it to never kind of materialise to its absolute maximum capacity by the fact that they were constantly guessing as to what position they were kind of playing and having to constantly think, well, okay, I'm left wing this week, I need to do this, but then I need to put more cross, but I need to do this, and then, okay, well, next week I'm number nine and, and, and whatever else. You know, I think some rigidity is not a bad thing. Well, in Martial's case, like, and, and Rashford's even got a couple of years on Martial as well, like Martial's 23 going on 24 this season, Mane's 27 going on 28, and even he never really sort of flipped his switch until he was hitting around about 25, 26 when he transferred to Liverpool. So I still think Martial's got another couple of years yet to, for it to really click into gear for him. And Martial's, as I say, still got another couple of years on him. I Rashford. think it's just because that... Rashford, sorry, yeah. Um, so they've got they've got time. And whether or not we have the time is is a another issue entirely. But... I think with because they are two where you know the fans will those two particularly they will go you know yeah like, they're forward players like if they don't click then you know they're they're the first ones to cop it um, especially if you know defense starts sorting itself out and things like that if it turns out that we're then not sticking away chances but we're not shipping them at the other end and Maguire or someone else has that kind of impact then yeah they they will start copping some stick but I I can see Rashford being big enough. To, to get over that kind of thing and I think he would be able to use it I don't I'm slightly more concerned about Martial than I would be against Rashford yeah, because I, I think they're both yeah, in the same, same spot same I mean yeah I'm expect I'm pretty comfortable that like Rashford is going to have a big year I'm not as sure about Martial and yeah it's kind of 50-50 on where he goes this year basically I'm kind of okay with Martial having like a 13 goal, 13 assist type season. Like if he can, I'd be delighted with it. Yeah, yeah. If he's coming from the left, then you can't expect him to score like 20 goals if he's playing yeah. mostly out wide. Yeah, it's... if he, if he double figures in both goals and assists, like I, I, I think his goal output coming from the left wing predominantly has been fine for the most part. Like I would just like to see him be more productive in terms of his final ball and actually laying more stuff on. I think if he manages to add that to his game a bit more, then I think. I think that, then that's that's him sorted. Then I just would like to see him release the ball a bit quicker. Equally with Marshall, you know, if you look at his stats, like productivity has actually not ever really been a massive problem for him. Typically, mm. if he scores, yeah, he true. he is involved in in meaningful ways. It's kind of the issue with him has been 
you'll do all that in kind of five minutes and the other 85 minutes can be totally abject. Well, the other thing I actually brought up like the end of last season that with Martial, that obviously Ole's going for a much more high energy pressing system. And I questioned whether Martial would be able to adapt to that kind of system. Cause you know, he's never been the one with like the highest work rate or highest kind of running stats. And I wasn't sure whether this kind of system would suit him. I mean, yeah, I've seen a lot more from him in preseason that he is ready maybe to try and do that. But yeah, until we actually get the Premier League going and see what he does in the proper matches, yeah, it still remains to be seen. Um, but yeah, of course, this has been a big focus and will be the big change from the way we played under Mourinho to the ways we play under Ole. Is are expecting a lot more pressing and uh, to be really hounding. And yeah, it's something that, it's been totally apparent in preseason so far. And I think, yeah, United fans will definitely prefer to be seeing that than the way we were playing before. So, yeah, it's something I think we should be quite excited to see how we adapt to that going forward. Um, so, yeah, I think we've kind of been a lot through the team there. There's, like we say, there's still a few places up for grabs in the first 11. Looks like seven or eight of the spots are more or less clear. Uh, still, obviously, there's a week left of the transfer window, so we may still have a new face in there. Um, but yeah, just to switch over, we did have a question from uh, Mollen Manden. He said, yeah, I would like to hear your thoughts about the captaincy situation. Ole told us that Ashley Young will captain the side when he's in the starting eleven, But, you know, how many games is he actually going to start? So, yeah, it's true. Like Ole had said, he was still thinking about it a couple of weeks ago. De Gea's had the armband. Pogba's had the armband. Matic, uh, Mata. I think, yeah, it's been passed around a fair bit in preseason. But, yeah, Ole did come out basically saying that Young will be the, what you call, club captain. Uh, But the only issue with that is how many matches is he actually going to play? And then in the meantime, does that mean the armband is passed around? I mean, it's, it's a thing I don't like that much where there's no clear kind of captain. It really should be somebody who's playing week in, week out for me. But we don't have that many obvious candidates, unfortunately. Um, I mean, for me, really, the best candidate, but yeah, he has to commit himself to the club, is Pogba. Uh, and I don't know, yeah, what do you feel about that, Cole? Not for me. Uh, no? not, for, not for me at all, no. Um, Why not? Uh, I think he's an exceptional player. And I don't think he owes Manchester United anything, but I think that that cuts both ways. And anyone, I, I totally appreciate Paul Pogba wanting to leave, and I truly believe he really wants to leave. I think he knows it's not financially viable this year for Real Madrid. I think there's uh, no other viable alternatives, which has left him in this odd pickle where they've kind of spent a massive part of their budget, three or four hundred million, very early on, Hazard. And all the rest of them, and 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 the deal is just not going to happen this year. And he knows that, despite him, you know, obviously doing essentially his best to to um, you know, force it through with his comments. I appreciate he could have, you know, completely down tools. He could say I'm going on strike, but he has to know the move isn't there. Just you know, financially, it seems it's it's just not there. That's fine because Paul Pogba is an exceptional footballer, and he has come back to United um, after being obviously a. a prestigious youth talent here and he has given us good years in a very very difficult period um in in the club's history and it hasn't clearly worked out the way he thought it might or wanted it to that's obvious for everyone so he can go it's not a problem i I bear him no ill will for that but he certainly cannot be rewarded with you know a 500 grand a week contract and the captaincy just for deigning to stay with us now i will be delighted that he is a manchester united player come september and i will or come august will come next week and i will support him passionately because i can accept someone just staying here for another year and then leaving you know it's very much like the ronaldo situation and it's all been handled as mark alluded to um quite well to be honest Ole did well with it even though there was quite a lot of sort of fan demand for had Paul would just be thrown out, and that was before we started playing any preseason football. And then people quickly realised, I think, just how important he is to this team and how this is a big year for us. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted that he's staying. Um, I think a lot can change in a year of football, and if he has a great year with us and we get more signings in, and this um, style of football kind of takes that Ole is trying to go for, and we finish third or even better, I wouldn't be surprised if if then you know. You just don't know what's going to happen next year. Real Madrid could, again, suffer financially or whatever. The, the move might just not materialise. And it may be that United are in a much better place next summer than we were this summer. And it could be a whole different landscape. And then Pogba might then commit further. 
But for the moment, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So for this year at least, I wouldn't have him anywhere near the captaincy. And, that, and that's not a slight, and it's not a, a bitter grapes or anything like that. Um, it's just that I don't think that's a behaviour that should be rewarded. And I don't think that's becoming of a captain, despite him being an exceptionally talented player and someone who will be absolutely key to us this year. Now, just to clarify, for me, he only should become, given that often is, if he commits himself with a new long-term contract to say, all right. If we give him a new long-term contract, a long term contract and pay him even more per week, which is already an obscene amount of money. He can still leave next year because there's yeah, true, you, contracts true. mean nothing in this day and age. You know, people give you see people signing a five year deal and go in the very summer after only pen and you know pen touch paper three months before. They literally mean nothing. Players and agents have all of the power in that respect, and I do think clubs need to take a firmer stance. Even that Maguire deal, you know. I can't, I can't be bad to Leicester for that because particularly Premier League clubs now can value their own stances with actual monetary backing because of the much much money they have now, you know, for just staying in the league or whatever else. So, like, if he signs a new contract in two months' time, he could still go to Real Madrid next summer. It's no problem, you know, and we have very little say in that. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, yeah, but what other, you know, what, so if we focus on the captaincy options, I mean, we're really quite lacking, aren't we? Uh, McSauce. My boy. Yeah, what about Maguire? Do we think <laughs> that he can uh, in the future come through? Now, I don't know if you saw, there was actually a poll on Red Cafe, and uh, I was a bit surprised myself that actually Lindelof won the Lindelof. poll for who yeah. they thought should be our kid, which to me was a bit weird because, yeah, I don't think he's really that like locked in and. He was um, pictured waving his arms about a bit at the end of last season quite angrily and then that people just sort of went, ooh, captain material, like because we haven't had a really good captain in so long. I think, well, it is definitely it is definitely an indictment on the options at Manchester United at the moment in terms of personalities in the squad. But if you look at uh, Lindelof's career prior to Manchester United as well, both um, in Portugal and for his um, national team, um, he is definitely captain material and I think it's quite... Uh, you know, he is a leader on the pitch and he does, you, you know, there may have been just a few angry tackles and a few arms being waved, as you say, and that's like an easy jab to make. But I think there is a genuine passion there. And I think he does see a long term future at the club, even though there was Barcelona interest this year. Supposedly. And his agent was bigging it up as well. Yeah. Like, what, Lindelof, like, what Lindelof's agent was doing was no different to what Raiola has been doing. It might have, Raiola dialed it up to 10, don't get me wrong. But like, I, I it, was, like wrong. It, was still, yeah. it was still equally ridiculous. Like Really, really, really opportunistic and a bit slimy. So that's kind of, kind of soured on Lindelof in terms of captain's so material. That's a huge overreaction to what is basically part and parcel for him. I'm not saying I hate the guy. Like He's, no, he's nowhere near Smalling. Why like, did he take Rashford, I mean, the local boy, and one of the absolute fan favourites so long to sign a new contract that was seemingly being haggled over prices. I mean, you could say, like, that's just that's just modern football, I think. You yeah, know, I, I mean, I don't have any issue with, like, what agents whatever say. I do have an yeah. issue with, like, you know, Pogba himself has yeah. come out and said... I have an issue with anyone putting it out there via their agent. That, and then that- No, but that's... Look, you can't... An agent can say whatever they want. That's nothing to do with the player. You can't put it on a player and what his agent says. You think the agent's acting on their own behalf. Like you think the agents? Just well, the agents it. are always acting for their own like personal gain, and their own personal gain for an agent is always to force a move. They always make more money when players move. Or get it's always contract. in a player's interest to get a transfer. See, if the agent was acting in a way that a player disagreed with, they can always walk away from the agent. Yeah, players, they yeah, they don't walk away that much from agents. You know, they have good relationships with them, and you know, if your agent has taken you from Portugal to Manchester United, you're not going to walk away from him. Why not? Because, like, you know, he's done well for you. You're happy with what he's done for you so far. So, like, you're, you know, you're but saying... Sure, but surely if you're then happy at Manchester United, then why would you be putting yourself in a position to, to then jeopardise No, that's what I'm saying. It's nothing Lindelof said. So, yeah, what his agent says is irrelevant. But, you know, if a player himself, like what Lukaku, Pogba have made, you know, certain comments themselves, then that's totally different. But, yeah, what a player's agent says is meaningless. No, I, I completely agree with you. Like, but, but, Pogba, but Pogba and Lukaku shouldn't, shouldn't... Neither of them should be near the captaincy either. Like... That. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, look, as I do still have this thing about Pogba that I still think he is the one that needs our whole team should be built around, and he is the future. But he has to commit to us, and yeah, it's not right after you know things he said. Being the most talented player on the pitch does not make you the captain. Look at Steven no. Gerrard. No, but I do actually <laughs> see like, captaincy in him as well. Like you know, in France as well, there was that video where before like the World Cup final, he was in the dressing yeah, room, conveniently getting filmed. people up. He does have something in him, but yeah, he... yeah. What a great motivational speech that was! Like lads, we're playing football and we have to win. 
for France. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Fan fucking tastic. Look, we're going to go out there and win this game. I don't. I think Pogba has leadership qualities, definitely, and I think he is captain material, but just not for Manchester United because he doesn't want to be here. And that's the that's the bottom line. I do. I really like Lindelof, and I, and I do think he has uh, a personality about him that should be rewarded. I also adore McTominay, but I just think it's too soon for him. Um, aside from that, I don't think De Gea, for precisely the same reasons as Pogba, should be the captain, and doubly so because he's a goalkeeper. Um, and it's difficult, you know. It's there's, there's yeah. I mean, De Gea's there's, actually there's, lack of kind of leadership and organising the defence is his big deficiency. Exactly, exactly. So, see, using using the captaincy as some sort of make weight in contract negotiations as well. I don't even believe it matters that much to players, really. Yeah, I mean, um, sometimes that armband is just passed around based on how long you've been around at the club as well nowadays, which is a bit of a shame. Like, you know, it's yeah. become like that at Manchester United for a few years. And if you think, Colm, like however long we've been doing this podcast, we've been talking about lack of, <laughs> lack of leadership. And yeah. it's been like, whatever, about four or five years now since, I don't know, Vidic or something that we've really said, yeah, we're really lacking. You know, all right, Rooney maybe was OK, but he wasn't even that great. Uh, it's been a long time since we've really had a great. And even Vidic, I'd say I'd go back to probably Gary Neville to say the last one. Did you really say, yeah, he's a proper captain? Yeah. I would just like us. I would just like to see. Would say that about Vidic. Yeah, look, Vidic was a good like, but again, he wasn't. I don't know. This the it's a bit different to what I'd talk about as your kind of Robson, Keane, Neville, where I say, yeah, all right, they are proper like nah, Manchester United that's captains. Well out of order. I would follow that man into hell. Yeah, like, look, as a player, whatever, I totally agree with you, but you know. Uh, I still didn't see him on that kind of level a as man. a leader. He's a unit. What yeah, yeah, look, about? look, he's an outstanding player, absolutely. But Patrice sometimes, you know, when these players are just picked as like kind of leading by example rather than actual, you know, leading the whole team. Um, I think I would like us to be brave with our choice. And um, I don't think it's necessarily the time. I'm quite happy for us to kind of hot potato it for a little while. But I, I honestly think McTominay is future captain of Manchester United. I think... You know, you only need to look at uh, the likes of a Delict or I think Andy Robertson. Um, he captains Scotland, does he? Does um, Tierney captain Scott uh, Celtic as no, well? I'm sure it's Robertson. Ed, uh, I don't know actually. Not sure. Um, I don't think it necessarily has to be someone who's been at the club ten years. You know, I think if you're exhibiting all the right qualities, then have at it. Um, so he certainly seems to be like in terms of just outwardly and what he's putting out there like I mean, he's interviews. the only one who's talking like a captain right now it's like whether or not he can actually exhibit it on the pitch on a regular basis is, is something else I'd just like to remind everybody that it was only a few months ago that Mark said McTominay was not good enough to be I just said I, I did say that I did say that I also said a couple of months ago that I was quite happily eating my own shit on that like he completely turned it around like, and what I said was if you listen back to what I just said was he's the one who's talking like a captain and maybe not exhibiting the performance Performances regularly, so yeah. eat my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah. had to remind that one in there. But yeah, I have seen a few. You know, we've not actually talked much about Maguire. Who, all right, it's not actually officially announced yet, but he has been at the club. He's had his medical today, and so yeah, we're assuming it's just formalities now, and he will be signed. It is a crazy fee. I mean, eighty million world record for a defender. But yeah, seventy million of that has been spent on his head. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> is exactly. his head really that slab? Like it's that that big. You We're pay gonna repair for the roof each, with each his head. inch of forehead. You need to pay an extra million, right? Uh, I, I think yeah. Maguire's face and his head have negatively impacted people's opinion on him as a footballer, which is so yes, unfair. I, if there was anyone who suffered from being not David Beckham in the looks department, it was Harry <laughs> Maguire. <laughs> No, but look, I'm really happy that he's come in. I think he is a very good defender. I'm not saying I'm an oil painting either. Like, I'm just saying <laughs> like, we can all we can all see that. Yeah, like that's not. <laughs> but he's not like he's not like horrendously, you know. No, like, he's no, not. We're not, not talking about like, Ian Dowie or Peter Beardsley here, right? He's like, like Phil Jones. <laughs> like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But he's like, it's like Phil Jones. Like Phil Jones suffers from his face. Like, yeah. If Phil Jones didn't pull those faces, then people wouldn't be on him as much as they are. Like, he, but Maguire is in that class as well. And to have Maguire and Jones potentially next to each other next season is just going to be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, there was some nice stuff that came out about Maguire as well. Did you see this going back to like um, Ferguson quotes? He was mm. playing for Sheffield United against us in the FA Youth Cup final way back in 2011. That was the team that was Pogba, Lingard, Ravel Morrison at the time. 
And uh, there's now a lot of little snippets coming out that, you know, Ferguson actually had a bit of a chat with him at the time and was quite talking him up even way back then. Uh, so, yeah, his kind of route to coming to us maybe has been a bit longer than it might have been. I mean, uh, it was actually, yeah, Steve Bruce as well, uh, one of our old boys who b- noticed him and brought him to Hull at that time. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, he's had the kind of these tenuous United connections throughout his year. So maybe it was just meant to be. He played a bit under Mike Freeland as well, didn't he? Did he? Was At he Hull? Still, was he still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, Mike yeah, Freeland yeah. I think you must be right. There. I think Steve Bruce bought him to Hull, and then yeah, he probably still did play for Feeling. Guardiola spoke about him today after uh, the Community Shield. Um, he was just asked about him. Did he say I missed that? City, City were interested, and he basically said we definitely were interested. He's fantastic in the air, great bringing the ball out, great with his feet. He's actually really, really fast. Um, mm-hmm. He's a super, super player, and we wanted him. We just couldn't afford him. Man United could afford him. So, well done, Manchester United, no, I hadn't, which, I hadn't you know, seen that. Okay, yeah. but he was. I think it was slightly a dig, also, at not you know sitting up, putting up the money because they clearly could have afforded him if they had wanted him. Yeah, I think uh, Pep does have this kind of uh, chip on his shoulder about people moaning that he's just bought the league, yeah. and Pep, yeah. yeah, he always wants to say, look that. Other players, are, other teams are spending money as well, I guess. Uh, but I just think it's good to see because I think people, you know, like similarly when City were linked with Fred and we bought him and everyone went mental thinking he's going to be class. But, you know, the fact that City are in for these players seems to add weight to people's perception of them as opposed to just looking at them when they play football. So, you know, I think Maguire has suffered from a lot of negative press by people who maybe don't think he's he's good enough or maybe not worth 80 million plus, which, you know, is, is a valid argument, but I do think people have been uh, overly critical, certainly on what I think has been a very impressive uh, last two or three years for. No. Yeah. And he's been great for England as well. The way he brings the ball out. Um, no, I'm, I think it's exactly the kind of play we need. Yeah. Maybe we've overpaid, but yeah. So what? Look, it's not our money. <laughs> you know, there's been a lot of this kind of glazer out stuff going on Glazer's out. this summer. Uh, but yeah, they've sp- they've paid the money, so yeah, we can't moan too much on the kind of Low transfer slabber, side of things. <laughs> yeah, we can't. You know, I've always said that like people who moan about how much has been invested in the team, how much is paid on transfers, is just ridiculous. There is plenty of things to moan about. Woodward is obviously a joker, and I did, did you see this Patrice Ever interview? Where oh god, yeah, you've got to see that where he talks about his contract extension and where Woodward just screwed him completely where basically they had a chat and ever said oh you know i think it's time for me to move on and Udward said fine and then basically the club um exercised their option over keeping ever at the club for an extra year without even telling him he just found out why there's agent that i'm actually staying here and so yeah i think there is a lot of things that are wrong in the back of the club and how things are done Little snippets come out from here and there. And yeah, for sure, for me, like the more focus should be Woodward out, really. Um, but look, players have come in. The transfer window is not finished. I personally don't expect anyone else to come in. I think no. it's probably like a bonus if anyone does. I mean, story has just come out today saying club are not going forward with Dybala now. Um, Good. I yeah. think, yeah, Lukaku, I assume, will still leave, whether it's to Inter, whether it's to Juve. I can't see him staying at the club now. Um, there's still maybe Manjucic or somebody might come the other way just as a kind of make way. And I think somebody like that with experience who's happy, assuming to come in from the bench, might not be too bad an option as well. Um, but as I say, I'm kind of assuming we are where we are now. And I don't think anybody else will come in if they do. I think it's a bonus. Whereas I still see some people talking about, oh, Fernandez, this and that. But yeah, as I said, I, as well as I think, Mark, you'll know from seeing on my WhatsApp, I take absolutely no notice of anything that's going on in all these transfer rumors and, yet, and all. Delight in I just assume that, that 99% of it is absolute bollocks. And <laughs> unless BBC are reporting something, I just say, oh, don't even tell me about it. It's all just rubbish. Well, the, the, just to go back into it, there's apparently now it's all coming out. There's actually been no indication whatsoever that Ruben Fernandez uh, in for Bruno Fernandez whatsoever this this year and this summer. So I think Fernandez has a um, it's got a hint of the Gaitans 
about it for certain. Like, yeah, their agents are just pointing out their players. And this is the thing, like people like, you know, they really like spend their lives looking at Twitter and reading stories and trying to say what's going on here. And 90% of it is bollocks. It's just stories spread from different agents trying to get their players out there talking up this. Maybe they're just trying to get their player a new contract and they don't even want them to leave. And yeah, the amount of time people spend like reading stories of transfer rumors and gossip and whatever is honestly, it's a total waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we're all on the same picture there. <laughs> well, like, uh, it, I mean, to me, like for for new signs, like for players like Fernandez and D- Dybala, like those guys just get in the way of Gomez, Chong, and Greenwood. Like, I think we've got players of Dybala and Fernandez standard in those three as long as we play them. So for, for me, it's just yeah, fantastic. That's you know the better part. Well. Dybala would come as part of Lukaku, I guess. But in terms of Fernandez, that's 70 million euros that you can save and you've still got three positions covered. You don't need to be worrying about having to say to Gomez all year, like, oh, don't worry, Dybala's not going to affect you. And then it become quite apparent in January, oh yeah, by the way, that whole Dybala thing, that, that kind of screwed you over a little bit. So anything that gets that boy locked down. It's a really tricky one because... A lot of it screams, no, don't do that. It's just going to go tits up again. And the other part of it goes, but can you really not take that player? Um, if he doesn't want United, then that's it, case closed, as far as I'm concerned. And I don't think we should be chasing silly money star players anymore. Um, if, like Simon Stone says, Simon Stone says, that's difficult to say, um, <laughs> we were never actually in for Bruno Fernandes this year, I will be gobsmacked because we did... Um, scout him extensively last year. That's that's fact. Um, but that's different. You can go and watch a player. Yeah, of course, There's it doesn't mean you have that. to bid for them. But having watched him score 31 goals and get 17 assists or whatever it is, and generally being very impressive, and I think fit the mould of what we need as a 10 come 8 in a quality... And I totally take what you're saying in terms of Gomez and Greenwood, but that's a lot put on those players and our hierarchy will not accept that. I think we need to start putting it on players a little bit. But I'm actually ready to put on these players. I'm ready to give these players a chance. Like, you know, we've had like failed... You like, can't mollycoddle these players. Like, this, is the, like you need to be patient with you, yes. But you can't wrap them in cotton wool forever. Eventually, they're going to need to have some pressure put on them to perform. That's a lot of pressure. That's not... I don't think it is. It's like... They're not coming into a good side. They're not coming into a functioning side. But yeah, you know, if we talk side. about pressure as well. You know, yesterday, these two stepped up in a penalty shootout and put away beautiful penalties. All right, it's a pre-season, pre-season. friendly. I know, all right. But still, they're we like, still they did it. still need to have the chutzpah to do it. Uh, you know, we don't have a good record in penalty shootouts over the years, To apart from obviously like 2008 where it worked out. And if football was just about taking penalties, then maybe that would matter. But Yeah, it, it but isn't. I'm just talking that I think these two, particularly Gomez and Greenwood, are ready. Those two, I think they're nailed it on. Is, it drips off of them when they're on the pitch that they are ready. Like Maybe not to start 100%, but yeah. they're ready for first team football like don't deny the minutes i totally agree i think gomez is uh the best technical player at the club in terms of ball to feet i think that completely he's also shown pre-season that he can play off the left which a lot of people wouldn't have necessarily thought and always earmarked him as a 10 his physicality is in no way an issue because he actually has that low center of gravity and big ass that really helps like a lot of small players we see <laughs> who are immensely successful in the league his touch and his ability are, he's got are a big butt and you cannot lie are so obvious he's he's going to be a quality 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 player Greenwood I think is an absolute future star he's totally two-footed he has this step over isolate your man drop a shoulder and then absolutely poon it and his finishing remarkably hasn't been that great on the tour which is the one thing he's normally very good at and um, well one of many things he's normally very good at but that will obviously come I think also he's a player that could completely eclipse Marcus Rashford in terms of being the uh, the big man you know for Manchester United leading the line I, I think that Completely, I, I agree on all those counts, and I think if not, if both of them didn't get somewhere in the region of ten to twenty games this year, if not more, it would be an absolute travesty and a huge failing on Ole's part. But there's a big difference between betting them in this year and throwing them in and relying on them to produce immediately and all that. And I just think we will have a very very difficult season because I still think we're one or two players who are twenty four, twenty five, who are quality, proven quality, um, to just freshen things up, you know. Just, just on the specific examples of Fernandez and Dybala, you would have Dybala coming over to a different footballing culture at 26 years of age after I'd being turfed Fernandes. out of a club that he Fernandes. loves. Yeah. So, so you would be 
expecting to write off a year for him like some people did for Lindelof and like some people did for Fred. You'd also have the exact same situation with Fernandes who would need to make the step up in quality from the Portuguese league to the Premier League. So give the young players that transitional year for what you expect from them. Don't You don't need to give it to these 70, 80 million pound players. Like if you're going to spend 70 to 80 million pounds on a player, I want them performing now. I don't want to be give, I don't want to be apologist for them and saying they need to settle into a new league or what have you. If you're going to be that apologist about players coming over and having poor poor bouts of form, give it the young lads. But it's not you know it's not a given that every single signing it, it's only a given for Manchester United that that happens with every single signing. You know, there's plenty of um, good examples of players coming in, a, in their first year from a continental league and and hitting the ground running. That's that's not always a problem. So to say that both those players would always need that year to have an impact and just to compare them to the young players. As if it's like chalk and cheese. If we're going to take the risk anyway, then why not play the cards that you already have in your hand? Rather than rolling the dice on to that you, you don't know what you're going to get from them. Like they, that, could, that could be two potential threads on our, on our hands. And we would have not, not, not only would, not only would they, they not be in a position to then succeed going into the next season. But you've also got Gomez who would walk away for free if he doesn't get the game time this year because his contract's coming up. Yeah. Greenwood obviously yeah, assigned his new deal. Actually. Yeah, his, what, his contract comes up when? End of this year. Nine months. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Yeah. It's, okay. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's next June. Like, yeah. so it's a huge, that's a huge issue. That's a huge issue that needs to be conveyed. And, you know, he, he strikes me as someone who's very, very, very committed to Manchester United, but he is also, I'm sure, totally aware of his quality. He will He's incredibly Sancho. switched on. Yeah. He's an incredibly smart professional. Like, even at the, like, even when you hear him talking the limited interviews that he's had, like, he's, he's extremely switched on. As a lot of younger players coming up these days, uh, they're completely switched on to their situation and they know that playing football is going to be best for their development. Yeah, I mean, he'll see Jadon Sancho only two days ago, you know, get a goal assist in the, you know, biggest game in German football, essentially. Um, and that won't go unnoticed, of course. So it is up to us to convince him that there is a, a path at Manchester United. But you cannot just, you cannot just throw them in and say you're, you know, put them under all that pressure. I truly think, I think it can be. There's no need to do it like that, though. Well, I think they actually, there's not, like I said, I don't think either of these two are going to be in our starting 11. So it's yeah, not like exactly. we're expecting them to, like, play week in, week out and start games. They're going to be slowly worked in and, you know, we've still got a good enough squad that, yeah, the, the yeah. Point being, the point being that they can be worked in even with a Bruno or a Dybala. But the problem, I, the, what I'm saying is, in, in the situation I'm saying, because I think if you're saying they're going to be worked in slowly, then who are we playing when they are playing? Lingard, Mata, Pereira in those positions. Dan James. Yeah, and I do think that Pereira deserves a chance this year. Uh, we've seen Lingard, Martial and Rashford excelling. I think we need more starter quality than those No, but three. listen, Lingard, Martial, Rashford, they excelled when Ole first came in. So why can't we replicate that again? I think we can, but I think it's it's thin on the ground in terms of actual quality. I think we need more starter quality. I think if you're telling me that those front... When you take Martial and Rashford out of it, if you're saying the rest of those positions are going to be... So two, two other forward-facing positions are going to be occupied mainly in the absence of the youth who are going to get 10, 20 games, are going to be mainly occupied by Pereira, Lingard, Mata and Dan James. I think that lacks starter quality. There's still Sanchez as well. Well, God knows what that'll look like <laughs> like next year. Honestly. Yeah, no, I almost don't want to mention him. But yeah, look, the guy is still at our club. If you count up the goal and assists that those... So take the players who have already been at the club. So Pereira, uh, Sanchez... Uh, Mata and Lingard over the last three or four seasons they won't have given us more than 40 goals and assists combined I would imagine and yet you want to put them in for the majority of the season while it's blood and youth I'm all about the blood and youth element I'm all about that Ch- uh, not Chong I think it should go on Greenwood and Gomez should get 10 to 20 games and probably more than that I would like to see them always be on the bench and I would like to see them start in a lot of games but leaving them out of it the starters the, the first 11 those four names that back up Marshall and Rashford, I think, are way, 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 way too weak to really do any real damage in the league. I, and I honestly believe that. I think they've proven that over the years. I think a few of them are great, great, great squad options. I think um, Jesse is a fantastic squad player and will start many a game. And he is more a sum of the parts player b- without being hugely impactful himself in a, in a purely statistical way of looking at it. But beyond that, you know, Pereira is a do big, big Do you think we win the league this year? Do I think we will? Do you think we're winning the league this year? No, and that's not even what I'm aiming for. I'm talking. No, 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 no. Uh, I, this is leading somewhere. Do you think we're winning the league this year? No, no, not at the moment. Do you think with our current squad we can get top four? Yes. 
So that's what we should be aiming for. Fernandez and Dybala aren't going to win this league. They're just not. This needs to be a. This needs to be a. This needs to be a fully transitional year, and it needs to have a full commitment to a, to the rebuild, and that needs to incorporate these these young lads coming up. And it's not just. But that what we're, we're beyond talking about it. It will incorporate those. Anyway, listen. I think like all right. I think we've got our uh, sections there. Colm thinks we're slightly short and need another player. I. I, I do see where I'd look we could do with it. I don't think it's the end of the world player. if we don't get him and I think it could be the making of those youngsters I do excite I get that yeah, yeah, I, look, get that, I, like I, I said think, I am excited know. about seeing some of these young players again and that's why probably I'm you know overlooking some deficiencies in the squad but yeah we've just had so many that's the thing as well we've had a lot of these players come in the last years who were big names and just didn't make it and we've just kind of had enough of that and just said listen let's play the kids Bruno isn't a big name and you know we could rightly see him go to Spurs this year I mean they're looking at La Chelsea or, or or Bruno by those crappy reports that really none of us actually believe but just to give them a moment if he goes to Spurs and smashes in 20 goals and they finish third and we're languishing in sixth at the end of the next year with you know Jesse having contributed five goals Mata having given us three Dan James I don't even want to put a, a number on because I don't think he should be you know judged too harshly in his first year and you know Greenwood and um, Gomez have been given a handful of games then you know we'll be sitting here going ah you know right next year we'll just buy that player yeah know? no yeah we'll reassess that around Christmas time so yeah we'll see but anyway look I think this is a good point to actually say because this is obviously the big question where do you think we're going to finish this year and uh, I did put this out in our kind of group and yeah a couple of people were sitting on the fence Ed said oh I'm not saying until it's the end of the transfer window but uh, general you know all right Mark where do you think we're finishing this year on the basis that we sign Maguire and nobody else if we're brave with the, some of these young lads, I think there's a very, very, very real chance that we can finish third. Third. All right. Calm. Uh, I think more than, I think if, if we just sign Maguire, which I think is the sensible position to, to make the judgment from, um, I think more than any individual signing, I think if we put into practice Ole's tactics and what he wants us to do, I'm quite confident we'll finish in the top four, top four. More like yeah, before. I guess I'm probably in like the same place there, third or fourth. Uh, I think everybody was around the same place, apart from Dave, who does some great work on our podcast editing, who thinks we can finish second and even challenge for first. He's well in. The, he's well in the Ole. Uh, he's ready for the new season. I, I could also easily see a place where we finish six or seven. Oh, absolutely. Easily. Yeah. Look, who knows? Who knows? It's uh, you know, we don't know where we're at. But I think, like, I think Liverpool are due. Like, I, I can't see Liverpool having a season like they did last season. Like, especially with the underinvestment that they've had in the squad over the summer. They've actually had a pretty bad like preseason, and I think they're going to suffer this year. Like, I think they look leggy and they look knackered. Like even in the champ, even in the charity shield, they look in preseason. They looked knackered, so I think there's a very real chance that they can see a massive drop off this year. Like I think City can walk away with this league now. I think I think they will. Um, I think not investing in your first team and on any level in a summer transfer window is always a recipe for disaster, regardless of how good your year before was. Um, I think that will be an issue for them. I think their midfield needs um a wee bit of work. So Alex Ferguson always said that you need to invest while you're on top. Like, and he was and he was correct and he said his biggest regret was not investing after that first Champions League win straight away so like Liverpool have obviously learned nothing I also think Chelsea will struggle I've watched uh, most of their preseason. yeah they look and crap Tammy Abraham looks okay well, actually, um, yeah, we, uh, we've not done a proper preview you know our first matches against Chelsea Frank Lampard's Chelsea so yeah Lampard versus Solskjaer it's like going back to the 90s um, I think they're in a similar position to us but a wee bit further behind to be quite honest um, I think Hazard's obviously a huge loss I think they still don't have a striker they're going to play um, Abraham they're going to play Giroud they're going to play um What's his face from Valencia and Crystal Palace, um, Bashuai. Um, and I don't think they're going to nail down a starter. I think Mason Mount looks like an absolutely tremendous prospect, and people will be surprised by how good he is. And I think Ross Barkley will have a huge year, but ultimately, I think it's they don't have enough quality in that squad without um, additions, and this transfer ban is going to hurt them. And I don't think Frank has the minerals, so I think it could be a tough year for him. They, um, they, they, they're stronger than us, I think, overall in midfield. But I think, and this is probably the first time I can say this. 
Um, it probably won't be the last time of season, but with our new look defence, I think <laughs> that they don't have anything to really trouble us up front. Tammy Abraham's not, he's not the finished article, although he's got potential. There is a lot of potential there within him. Like he's, he's nowhere near starting for Chelsea and their defence is, well, it has David Luiz in it. So there's always hope. It's aging. Yeah. And Rudiger, Rudiger's terrible. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting, actually, thing at Chelsea is that this transfer ban is going to force them now to use some of these players that, you know, they've always had like 20, 30 players out on loan, some ridiculous number. But these kind of guys like Zuma, Abraham, and some of those younger guys who weren't getting enough minutes, uh, hudson Adoys and um, Loftus-Cheek are surely going to be... I think long term it could be a really good thing for them uh, to uh, force a rebuild, basically, and, and reevaluate the way they, they operate. So I think it could be a good thing for them, but I think it'll be kind of like us. I think it'll be short term, short term pain first, you know. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, it will be interesting to see how Lampard does over there. I mean, yeah, look, but in and general, Arsenal still haven't bought a centre back, so I just need to put that out there. I just have Arsenal Tourette sometimes. Like, how yeah. have Arsenal still not bought a centre back? They expect us to be excited again that they've signed another fucking winger. Yeah, and they still haven't signed a centre back. Yeah, I don't I like, and I, I like Emery. I think he actually did a very good job last year when it looked like it all might fall apart halfway through. Um, the state of the ship and they, the, there is a decent 11 there but it's just same old Arsenal I just see the same problems lack of leadership lack of spine and a few dodgy characters that they just can't seem to get rid of they're always going to hold them back and I, I just see that being the exact same thing this year No look in general I'm looking pretty forward to this season I'm kind, pretty happy with our transfer window I mean I didn't finish saying before that I do still think the big negative has been that this whole thing that you know we were promised at the end of last season that there'd be a restructuring of the club and a kind of director of football coming in and that's not happened at all uh, and that's the only big negative for me is that you know when Mourinho left I remember we all said on this podcast that look the big thing that needs to happen is a big change inside the club and they've kind of gone with the easy option of giving Ole the contract and Woodward still seems to be in charge. And that, for me, is still a major problem. And there is still, you know, a lot of, like, negativity around that. Um, I, you know, I don't know where we're at now with this talking about somebody else coming in, whether they're just abandoning it. You know, apparently several people were talked to, but it's, nothing has happened there. So that, for me, is the only kind of negative, that there hasn't been this big restructure and we still not have that much change in what's going on in the background. But apart from that... I'm looking very forward to seeing a lot of the young players coming in, the new kind of Ole system. And yeah, I'm feeling good about the season coming up. Yeah, I agree. And if only by virtue of the fact that I, don't, I think everybody else is kind of, apart from maybe Spurs, and you can never be sure what you're going to get out of them in terms of their science. Undone belly would be big for them. But I think everybody else, is, apart from City, is taking a step backwards towards us. And I think that with signing Wan Bissaka and Harry Maguire, definitely we're, we're dragging them down to our level. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like we raised them, we raised everyone up to our level, and then we fell off, and now we're dragging them back down again. Yeah. It's we're going to ruin the Premier League so hardly. Um, yeah. I just hope people temper their expectations because I think um, I think it could be a very exciting year, but I think what will go hand in hand with that is frustration because I don't think it'll be all swashbuckling football, um, and I don't think it'll all be um, rainbows and lollipops. I just think there's still coaching that needs to be done with this squad to play the way Ole, I think, wants them to play. I don't think it's there yet. I think you see bits of it in preseason, which is fantastic, but it's tough to coach that through a very arduous Premier League season and there will be there will be stumbles along the way, I think, in a, in a big way. So I just hope I people... do think, though, that the expectation level will be lower. Like, you know, the one thing I always said was under Mourinho that when you have a manager like that, who spent a lot of money on big players and plays like a style of football that we don't really like. The yeah. only thing that can then keep the fans happy is to win, is yeah. to be challenging, is to win trophies. Now that Solskjaer comes in, I think he's going to be given a lot more leeway by the fans as long as there is attacking football, as long as there is excitement at Old Trafford. I think, yeah, people will give him time. Whether he'll get time from the boardroom is another matter, but I don't think that you know fans will turn on him like you know they have done with other the last two managers where simply they weren't happy with the style of football that was going on uh, you know and when you're not happy with the style of football if you're not winning games and you're not winning trophies then yeah it's the end of if the road pre-season match day threads or anything to go by I uh, maybe maybe do not share your optimism <laughs> way too much like negativity and you know people moaning about this everybody likes to moan nowadays and it's all fueled by like YouTube jokers and stuff like this and you know, uh, like I say, Old for man, me... Old on a rant. 
it's YouTube's <laughs> fault. Oh, I'm biting my tongue so hard. Like, I can't. Don't yeah, make yeah, me do like, it. I, I just see uh, too much moaning, too much this and that, and like a lot of social media is to blame for it. But yeah, that's just the way the world nowadays. Whether it's with players, whether it's with fans, that's just how it goes. And uh, even just saw a couple of hours ago there was something ridiculous, like open letter from Paul Lintz, uh moaning about <laughs> the club. Well, like Paul Lintz, like big time Charlie number one. I mean, what on earth is he? got to say about the club over here and yeah as I say there is things that are not right in the club and there is things that need to change but you know generally I'm ready to get behind like the new kind of way going forward focusing on young British players the youth (laughs) academy coming through yeah yeah look for me it's something that I can actually say yeah I want to go back to Old Trafford and uh, get ready for the new season open letter from Paul it has to be the new what does Ja Rule think of this? <laughs> I couldn't even believe it. And then I saw that it was some Paddy Power promotional rubbish, basically. I was like, what on earth is this? Open letter from Paul Lintz. And then I realised, oh, it's Paddy Power just looking for some more like publicity and like column inches again. But yeah, look, that's the way things go nowadays. Um, but yeah, look, uh, I think we've hit around our hour mark again. Uh, don't know if you guys, if we've missed out anything major. Um, we've given uh, our good Goldbridge thoughts. there. That's major. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you're starting an East Coast, West Coast war over here, right, Mark? Fuck uh, that dude so bad. Yeah, look, but, yeah, welcome back to Colm. And yeah, I am hope you're going to be back on regular rotation right this season. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, big reminder to everybody out there, please do uh, give us likes on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. You know, we need that kind of stuff to keep the podcast going. Um, yeah, we do, of course, like to get your comments and feedback back on Red Cafe about the podcast, reviews on iTunes. Yeah, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, we need to get... We might have a um, big podcast announcement soon as well, mightn't we? Yeah, yeah. There are a couple of things we're working on in the background. And yeah, when it's all ready, we will let you know. Um, but yeah, it's, that's the la- number three in our preseason podcasts. And as I say, we're, I think, a lot more positive than maybe a lot of the fans out there nowadays. But yeah, I say to everybody, Look, get behind the team, get behind the new regime, and let's see what we can do from there. Is that fucking massive? <laughs> All right, that's a good night from me. Good night. Good night.